I've never eaten a person, but today I might. I wake up in my thicket to the sound of whip cracks and look out and see a bulky man in a brown leather jacket and brown hat swinging the whip toward two other people, a man and a woman. The woman holds a phone up and says, you look just like him, oh my God. The man with the whip smiles and cracks it again and I feel something in my, the bottom of my stomach that's not hunger. I also feel hunger. The man without the whip lies down on his back and spreads his legs and lifts his feet up to the sky and shouts, okay, do it, just flick him, just lightly flick my nuts. The man with the whip snaps his arm back and forward and the whip hits the dirt in front of the lying down man. And the lying down man says, yes, yes. The woman presses her phone and says, be careful, those are my boys. I try to understand people, but they make it hard. The man on the ground is skinny and the woman with the phone is skinny, but the man holding the whip is thick and his neck bulges against the collar of his tan shirt, and I can see a vein and hear the blood running down through his arm, and his arm flexes and gets meaty every time he raises the whip. The whip hits the ground and kicks up dust, and it sounds like the torment of all big cats. Fuck this guy. I can smell his insides. My mouth waters, and the drool slides down and soaks my paws. I smack my lips louder than the whips crack and the people stop like they heard me and the lying down man stands up and the woman turns her phone in my direction and the man with the whip holds the whip at the ready. Yeah, I heard that, says the woman, like someone asked her a question. I'm not scared of their eyes. I'm the same color as my thicket and the same color as the ground. No one sees me unless I want them to. The whip makes the bulky man brave, and he steps slow toward me and squints and leans in with his throbbing neck vein in full focus. My mouth opens and I judge the distance between the man and his skinny friends and try to decide if I can drag him into the thicket quick enough. I wonder if they'll chase or if they'll run away. It's been weeks since I've eaten anything bigger than a raccoon. I think of how many meals I can get out of this man and how if I store him down in the caves, the vultures won't find him and I'll be able to come back over and over to eat a little more. I think of all the nights we'll spend together, this man and his guts and me. Let's get food, says the man as he coils the whip around his fist and pulls his neck away from the path of my teeth. The woman claps her hands and says, yeah, I thought I was totally over brunch, but I guess I'm not. I watch them walk fast on the trail and I go to sleep because sleep takes my hunger away. When I wake up, I hear the last of the day's hikers passing my thicket, two girls with huge water bottles that bounce the sunlight through the branches and into my eyes. It's not easy to sleep on an empty stomach, but I guess I did okay. One girl says, God, I can't believe it's dark already. I know we have to start starting earlier, says the other. She takes a sip from her bottle and says, no how, matter how much I say no and cancel stuff, there's still no time. And the first girl says, that's just your scare city mentality. You have to work on that. Yeah, I just, you know, this is just, I know I don't like change, says the second girl. And the first girl says, of course, but we all live in scarcity under capitalism. So we all have to make an effort to deprogram a scarcity mentality as like our central driving force. Their voices get lower and then I can't hear them anymore. And I yawn and stretch my paws out and their water bottles vanish with their bodies in the sunset. I shouldn't be here and neither should they. Now that the hikers are gone, I leave my thicket and go down into the dry ravine where lots of water used to flow and I eat bugs and suck at the little trickles to make my thirst less. I remember the last rain and I remember I wasn't happy about it, but I don't know how long it's been since. Now I need water to come from the sky or anywhere else. I need more than a dirty sip. I think of the girl hikers and the shiny bottles they gulp out of and I paw the dirt for more caterpillars and eat them. And I know I have to find somewhere new to drink. Things are changing. A while ago, I wouldn't fantasize about eating a person. What the girl said makes sense. I'm not sure what a scare city mentality is, but I have it. Here is called different things by different people. Mostly they say LA, but they also say the park or Hollywood. I hear that word a lot. I know I live below the Hollywood sign because the hikers say, oh, look, we're below the Hollywood sign. And they say, can we get all the way up there? And they ask, which letter would you jump off of? I've been up there, but at night lights come on and it's too exposed, so I stay down where I am now. Views don't matter to me anyway. The hikers say things like, look at that view, or say things like, we have to do this more often, get up here and get perspective. What they see makes them point or stop and turn and put their hands on their hips and breathe deep. But the distance they love is an out of focus blur when I try to look where they're looking. All I can see is what's right in front of me. All right, thank you.
Thank you so much, Henry. That was beautiful. Um, so as I've said to Henry, this is my favorite book of the year um, by far, maybe one of my favorite books of a couple of years. Um, and um, I wanted to just ask you first, and especially for those who have not yet read the book, to talk a little bit, um, you know, about the inception for this book about a um, mountain lion with human characteristics um, prowling, uh, prow prow prowling Los Angeles, prowling, prowling the park and then the streets and, and a home in Los Angeles. Well, so like you, Melissa, I'm not from Los Angeles, but I arrived in Los Angeles. Um, I came out there for, my partner was in grad school and then I was in grad school. And then we just sort of ended up with our sort of art community in Los Angeles proper. And we moved to the neighborhood Los Feliz, which is just on the very fringe of Griffith Park. The houses go up into the hillside um, of Griffith Park, up toward Griffith Park Observatory. And so I moved in that neighborhood, um, you know, over 10 years ago. And um, around the same time, a cat that became very famous, a, a puma, so big cat, mountain lion, goes by many names, but it was designated P-22, crossed the 405 freeway from where there are quite a few other pumas um, and was sort of living this isolated life in the Griffith Park mountain range. And I learned about this cat. Um, I learned about it most expressively when it was living under a house in, the, in my neighborhood. It had just been chilling under a house for a really long time without people noticing, you know, just sort of, in, I think in the crawl space below house um, where it could get in. And I thought this was just so fascinating. Um, I think, you know, it, it became like a, the cat became a local celebrity, but for me, I was like, oh, wow, like, how do you sort of exist in the city, but exist so quietly and strangely? Um, and I felt sort of similar. I felt a little bit like I'd come to this place I didn't understand that I was kind of in my little apartment without a lot of light, even though it was LA. <laughs> I just sort of felt a kinship, let's say. And I would hike in the park. I would sort of push myself to do that. Um, and I would always think of this cat just sort of lurking right out of right out of our view. Um, and maybe one day I would encounter it. Um, and so that was sort of this haunting the whole time I was in LA. And it was only when I moved back to New York right before the pandemic that I sort of thought, oh, like I was writing some other book and I was like, mm, I feel LA like pulling it at me. You know, I, I want to write about this sort of almost lost decade I spent there. You know, I, I did amazing things. I made great friends. Um, I became an author basically there. Um, I don't think I would have been had I not moved to LA um, and found that specific kind of isolation. But in all that, I thought, what just happened? And how can I talk about it? And I knew a lot of people were writing LA novels, friends of mine, LA novels about the art world, about Instagram, about things that, you know, like I know about, I have experience of, but I just thought that's not my way in. And then I heard a song and I've talked about this um, quite a bit, but it was just a line from a song by Nick Cave where he mentions a cougar in the Hollywood Hills. Um, and just, it had just come out. And the minute I heard that, I thought, oh, P22, that's the voice. I will write a book completely in the monologue of this mountain lion. And that's how I'm going to do it. And whatever the mountain lion experience is, it will speak to what LA was for me. And whatever the mountain lion thinks, it will somehow give me a way to articulate what LA was for me. And that's like, really, it didn't take me very long. It was a blast. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that I mean, that's so interesting, right? That you, um, because I wanted to talk about, you know, we have, we have arch like, all of our experience, all human experiences, right? Everyone's lives are different, but we have these um, primal emotions, right? Um, which, um, you know, it's debatable what my, I actually have my mountain lion here with me, um, but <laughs> my pickle, but, um, you know, and it's debatable, like what range of emotions animals feel, but for amongst humans, right? We, um, there's, there's a commonality that's where the universality is um is in that emotional realm and um you know we as writers how do we render that imagistic right and how do we personify that and i think like one way is we use archetype or we use um imagery and and that being said um here we have um you know a mountain lion with 
human characteristics. And I wanted to just ask you um, really um, to talk in any way that you feel inspired about the connection between human and animal, um, you know, the primal part of ourselves, the ways that we might project on animals, um, really any, any connect, any, uh, anything that inspires you about that. Yeah, I think that what really helped me not only enjoy the writing process of this book, but also just write it fundamentally was to connect to those more basic things that I think that, um, you know, we have this little moment of mishearing scarcity, like a place as scarcity um, that people were talking about a lot. But this idea of like a discomfort with the apocalyptic nature of like our climate moment and Los Angeles's general moment. You know, I remember moving, you know, when I just moved the hills being on fire and ash raining into my where my car was parked and just thinking, OK, this is a very different paradigm, you know, um, this is not necessarily where we're supposed to be, you know, um, but that idea of that fear and then also just hunger and feeling like you're not necessarily like you're a little bit abandoned by a care community or by by just everyone being taken care of. I think there was a sort of idea behind a lot of what I was writing where I was like, I can I can access that. Like and also, I can also access isolation as a writer, as a person who has a disability, like I sort of I find myself in the position to be internally experiencing things that keep me separate um, from others. And um, so there were all these aspects of my humanity and by the humanity I, I recognized in so many people um, who were confronting these moments of whether it was the drought we were experiencing, whether it was the mudslides when the rain did come, um, whether it was you know just not having breathable air for a couple of days, um, these kind of things that we would experience in Los Angeles. And then just the moment of like, you know, the 20 teens, I guess, is where when this is set, you know, um, this is like probably mid Trump era that I said it, although it's never made like actually explicit, but there's sort of this feeling that there's a futility to getting sustenance, getting, you know, universal sustenance. I mean, like to, to not seeing just bizarre and upsetting inequality at any moment, <laughs> at feeling like we're all hustling or grasping for things that are just pretty fundamental that should be fundamental I think whether it's universal basic income or housing you know or just the ability to to socialize and create um without fear um these are really we're just powerful things and I think those things on this very very primal level the cat is experiencing and it's experiencing humans talk about these things but it's experiencing them as we see like in just ways where, okay I'm pretty thirsty and there's very few areas where there's pooled water <laughs> That was, I mean, one of my favorite parts of the book was, um, you know, um, when the cat is in the park and watching the hikers, right? And the discourse and the dialogue. I mean, it was a great way to add characters into a book that could have been more insular, right? Um, but there was sort of a, there was humor in, in uh, you know, I, I felt that there was a bit of tongue in cheek and and a little bit of poking fun at, you know, our human um, conversations and our human sort of takes on things, right? And um, our attempts to solve what is ultimately bigger than us or our opinions on things. Um, but um, how did you relate, I guess, to the humans? Did you did you feel like you wanted to sort was there was there were there cynical elements to that or um, was there some love there? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I I would like to think there's love there. I mean, I I loved I loved living in Los Angeles. I loved people of Los Angeles. Love everyone I met. You know, not everyone I met, but you know, I I I really did. I found I found so much there that I think would have been written off maybe by different era me or by people I knew who didn't have a lot of experience of LA. Um, I think what I tried to do with you know the overheard right, which is it's sort of like you know this overheard in LA aspect where you're getting these very micro conversations and fragments of of you know, humanity and discussion of these hikers and people who hike, you know, it's like often it's, you know, it's not like people of immense privilege, but people who can, you know, sometimes hike during the day or like don't have to go to work. There's a lot about, you know, underemployment talked about. Um, I, I felt like this was part of the culture that I was experiencing was sort of a strange amorphous um, engagement with the day to day and with work and also with weather and, you know, sort of always being pleasant enough to get out and enjoy um, if you had that privilege in that space. But I sort of loved creating these things. A lot of them were very much just like things I had overheard. 
and overheard in passing, whether it was hiking or walking or just at the table next to me at a restaurant and just had, you know, retained or <laughs> just pulled from. And that's sort of how I kept this going is if I needed just something, I'd be like, okay, well, what's one random thing that I had written down in my, my boneyard of notes and how will the cat hear that? And what will that mean? But what I tried to do was give each of those characters a real full life, as you say, like peopling a book that is pretty, you know, lean with characters. Um, but I was like, okay, no, these are full characters. Like I know who they are. Um, you know, I don't know them personally, but like I know everything about this character. I could write a book about them and we're only going to hear two sentences from them or something, you know, <laughs> or like this character is me. There's one who's absolutely me who has like a little moment. And I was like, oh yeah, it's not a flattering one. <laughs> um, but then also building this, uh, as we hear this man with the whip, who sort of becomes a nemesis throughout the book, um, sort of a recurring fixation and cause of, and maybe stand in for some of, you know, humanity's worse or more frustrating or complicated impulses. Angelino's more intense sort of destructive impulses. Um, he was based on my neighbor who lived <laughs> next to me. Um, and I don't, harbor any ill will for this this man but he was a he has, was an indiana jones impersonator often i think even not professionally just for fun and so he would you know practice with a bullwhip outside my window like during the day you just go out there and be cracking a whip so very much that opening encounter was like how i was feeling just like how do you how do i make sense of this and how do i like live alongside something that feels like very hollywood very strange very bizarre um and that whole sequence with the with the nuts and the person laying down, that all just happened outside my window at a Halloween party. So I was just like, yeah, this is like so much of what I was doing was like, well, I didn't know how to make sense of these overheard or fragmentary experiences of other humans. So certainly my cat's going to not be able to, but but the cat's going to try. Whereas maybe I gave up. I just wrote it down and thought, you know, one for the book. But the cat got into it even more than I could. You know. Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I loved about the novel is, um, you know, the mountain lion's outsider status and, um, that, that outsider perspective, um, and, um, and, and really like, I think, you know, there's some personification there of, of human outsider. Certainly there's, um, the mountain lion is a sexual outsider in, in some ways. Um, and, um, Yeah. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, I think that, um, absolutely. I mean, I think that I really do, I did really find a lot of my own self in this character. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, I just, the way that I feel distanced from people and experiences, um, this really helped me channel that. The way I feel distanced from gender and sexuality and really complicated sort of I guess unique ways antisocial ways let's say um evolving ways you know I'm not just like joining the fray of like one specific way of being and that's just never been me um my whole life and um to be able to navigate that from like an inherently fictional imaginative you know fantastical space of the interior of the cat was really pleasurable to get at those issues of yeah, I think the universality really is the outsiderness. I think we all feel distance from our own experiences, from from the horrors of climate grief, like from other people that may or may not have destructive impulses or overwhelming impulses, or we just don't know how to relate to. Um, but sort of fundamentally, there was a lot of projecting on the actual cat of P22, um, you know, like when it became a celebrity and was in the news a lot, you know, and tracked by papers and also by, you know, naturalists in the area. Um, there was a lot of like, oh, it's like a ba eligible bachelor P22 or whatever. Um, like, look, at oh, he'll never find a mate. What a shame. And I was just like, yeah, maybe like P22 is not a breeder. Like maybe that's that's not like the main focus of of the cat's life. And we, we don't have to like project our own like heteronormativity or even like modes of, you know, a life trajectory. I was like, this cat's had a very unique experience and continues to, you know, but I think there was a lot of trying to make it like, a tragic figure or an eligible bachelor or whatever <laughs> all those hilarious like projected things and I thought well no let's let's take this cat like when I will in inhabit the voice and I'll just take it outside of those spectrums and you know and my cat is on like a, a journey of gender um you know um both for, like and also just a very queer journey from like the way it grows up and does not fit and you know and has desire for like another male you know male bodied cat um and then goes on this sort of journey of being affirmed as what i like to think of as a, you know as a, as a goddess right this is sort of like like 
a goddess narrative to me They're like becoming um, and that's something I'm very interested in right now I may even be doing it again right now <laughs> but like but I love the idea of of of, a, of that journey of like not just a journey of of gender affirmation but a journey of becoming something more powerful through that through that breaking out of norms yeah totally and and your cat has um I love that a goddess a goddess journey a goddess narrative the emerging right um or the becoming maybe the becoming what we are um you know, your cat has a, um, there, there is, has a former love, um, who, uh, was killed and, and, you know, that there's a lot in this book about, um, I think to some degree urbanization, um, you know, but definitely, as you mentioned, climate grief and, um, when you were when you were like conceiving of this book or in the germ of this book um you know how important was that to you or was that something that came along was that something that sort of that that came along later um as you considered um the the plight of of the mountain lion and and of us all really yeah i mean i basically like the way i wrote what i just read was just like, let's try this. You know, I, I, like I said, I had that inspiration, that excitement to just get away from whatever else I was crafting and do something very straightforward um, and one voiced, you know, and visceral. And I think within 20 pages, I was like, oh, like I'm talking about how we're responding to this moment. And I'm talking about what becomes very normal elements of Los Angeles and now a lot more sort of globally and nationally, people are dealing with, you know, unexpected unexpected but you know what I mean like what seemed to them shocking weather events and disruptive um I mean a pandemic is part of it but right but very disruptive um you know events that just alter our day-to-day -day, um that has become somewhat you know I don't know I think uh complacent right and I think we don't know how to process the larger things. I think we we have to limit ourselves, you know, to be able to to even, I don't know, to think through to be proactive. We have to, we can't take it all on. And I mean, you can't take on all of existence and mortality. So how can you take on like the idea of like global death or the wiping out of our species? Like it's really intense, you know? And I think, um, and so I was like, okay, well, this voice will be perfect to ruminate on these things in the way that it would. And and I think it'll call attention to them. But I was never like, I never set out to write like a climate novel. I, I don't think I ever set out to write like I don't usually set up with ideas. I know that ideas will emerge. I sort of am just like excited about story and voice, um, maybe a little more and, and also language, you know, and, and, and ex philosophical expression through a very like, I don't like to feel like a philosopher. I just like to feel like, I, I like to feel like dumb. Like I, I like to feel like not, um, I like to feel like a uh, sophomoric in my expression. And I think the cat was a great way to be that because I just think that's a good way to like, I don't know, I like that about like, what Twitter used to be or whatever, you know, like, um, like what, what you create is like these beautiful ways to just like, um, without a sort of distancing, I don't know, wisdom or authority to like speak to really incredibly uh, resonant little morsels of thought and expression, whether they be nihilistic or humorous or painful. It's just such a wonderful part of your work. And I think it's something that I'm very inspired by. Um, and so I guess that's where that's where ideas would emerge. It was just like, okay, well, the cat's going to be thinking about being hungry and also going to hear someone talking about being a poet. So how do those things intersect? You know, and like, and it'll mean something about Los Angeles's climate. Like th that just would happen. It was these just wonderful little algebraic moments for me in the organic process of writing. Yeah. Wow. Um. So. So it's so your your inspirations often begin so it begins for you with voice and a bit of story and it's not a novel of ideas, um, same, um, yeah. yeah. Um, although yeah, I've had I've had both, but I think that yeah, voice is something that um, you know you have a background in in poetry, right? Is that is that yeah you know, some, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, an image too, right? Um, that all, this book really, uh, you know, to me, um, 
reads like poetry and the way that it's um I mean there's not there's some in jam I'm, I'm like holding up the book but there's some in jamment but the way the you know but the way the lines are um the way you use um breaks as punctuation right and um it's written one would one could say it's written um you could call this a long poem um yeah, yeah or a prose poem um and I don't think there's any periods in the book is that correct yeah yeah it's, it's um, unpunctuated yeah <laughs> it's an unpunct. oh yeah so there's oh I don't there's no comma there's you know only I, apostrophes <laughs> I did those are not my little claw that. marks that's all I allowed myself yeah the apostrophes are your claw marks I did not just know just for clarity I, I was very aware that there were no periods. I was not aware that there were no commas as I was reading it, which is an interesting, um, good for you. Um, <laughs> how did how did the like the style of the book evolve? Was it was it did it begin? I mean, did it solely like did it begin unpunctuated and then you just kept going, or um, how did that how did that evolve? Yeah. I mean, yes, it did. And I just sort of gave, I mean, the way it looked on my Word document is the way it looks in the finished book that we're holding, um, which is that I just, yeah, I started that way. I was like, oh, this will just let me, it just, it just was more fun for me to write that way. I think I just have an inherent, and maybe that's, and like you say, I have a background in poetry, but really I have like a background, like just like writing hybrid work that doesn't really take a normal punctuated form that does employ line breaks or stanzas or white space, just something I would do, especially I, I got my MFA at Cal Arts and like the privilege, you know, the sort of the, the freedom we got to experiment with form um, freed me up to actually want to write instead of like when I maybe at some point, and I didn't always want to be a writer. I was a sort of screenwriter for a while and did film um, and theater chiefly. And those things, the way that can, form can be constricted, especially screenwriting, like just made me so exhausted as just a craftsperson. So whenever I get into like writing, like doing a double spaced document, like I with normal paragraphs, I'm just like, I'm back in middle school or whatever. Like I, this isn't something I, that frees me up. And so I just sort of started doing it this way with just basically, yeah, like major line breaks to just give each little bit of breath. Um, and I kept just going and it kept working. And, and then I was like, maybe this is a readable form for this to continue in. So maybe this is how I share it. And like, it's how I shared it with my agent. And, you know, that he didn't have a single note about that aspect of it. He's like, yeah, that's cool. We got this, you know, like, um, so I was very supported in that. Um, but I think it was just, it got me, it got me through the writing process. And I think it helps the reader maybe, I don't know. Like I thought it would be fun to keep it kind of like a roller coaster for the reader and have that sort of resonance of verse, even if it's not, you know, in any way like poetry, it's just these sort of prose fragments that flow you know but it, but it gives those lines the power that I love in in your poetry and contemporary poetry you know and even in just like social media expression that I find fun and valuable like isolating little moments and it's a lot, a lot harder to do when you're reading a I mean you can just have a wonderful exhaustive prose paragraph in a great novel you know that's in a traditional layout and form um but you know you kind of you find that isolation me I'm, I'm doing all the isolation I'm like no you're gonna get like it's gonna be the last thing and it's gonna be its own little line and maybe it's overdoing it but I enjoy reading things like that so I enjoyed writing it you know yeah uh the screen for those who don't who haven't done any screenwriting the the program that most screenwriters use is called final draft and it's kind of hell it's like um it's sort of like Legos, but not in a nice Tetris way. And I often feel it really impedes the flow because by the time you've sort of, it formats for you, but there's a, um, but there's a, there's definitely a big focus on it. It's very much like it shoehorns your text into its form. And um, there's a lot of sort of, yeah, mark. It's it's the opposite of open throat. Let's <laughs> let's put it that way. Ooh, yeah, yeah, a lot totally. of white space in screenwriting. Yeah, that true. could have been an influence. So um yeah, I was wondering, um let's see, I was wondering um like uh you know when like, I don't know, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? You said that you have a background in theater. Um, and this was a question I was going to ask anyway, but mm -hmm. sort of when did you know and, yeah. and how did that come to be? Yeah, I mean, the author thing is is the longer journey, I think, you know, being a book writer. Um, I have been a writer 
every second of my life. I think the second I could read, I, I was writing. I, I mean, my parents you could could tell you, and they might be here, they're probably here right now. But um, but you know, they were just incredibly supportive of reading and 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 exposed me to a lot of just like work that maybe was above my above my pay grade when I was two. But I got into reading really early and and just the minute I was reading, I was writing. Um, I would just, I would try to write, whether it was just coming up with the story and talking it out, you know, I couldn't stop talking, you know, I still can't, can't stop thinking. So like, I was always just channeling that into creativity. I think it's just a way that I process probably like trauma and other things that, you know, um, that were happening in my life. But in general, it's just like, yeah, like the creativity, the churning mind, it's just something I can't get away from. And I always did. And I would try to sort of pivot. I would, I certainly don't write all the time. Um, but I always feel like a writer. Like I always feel like I'm just I'm holding back a flood of of creation. Um, it's a strange thing, you know, because I I feel like if I write every day, I don't know. I, I like to be a little more distilled, so I really let it fester <laughs> or marinate. Um, I'm not like a daily writer. And this book was written like I, I didn't write. There's not stuff that there's only a little bit that was even cut from this book. I actually added stuff to the final version, you know. So it was very lean as a writing expression and, and my books all are if you check out my other ones it's that's just my form um but I've always been a writer but I think until I had decided to do film for undergrad and I was I worked in film as a producer I did some screenwriting I wrote some plays you know short films I, I did a lot of things in that world I was just always feeling I always felt limited by that second step by that like I mean I love collaborating and that's why I love being a producer was I was like well I like helping other people make their work but for me, I was like, I don't know how to create work if I have to think about how I'm going to pay for it or budget it or bring people together or even like drive a van out of Manhattan into Brooklyn or whatever. Like all these kind of things were so limiting that coming back to writing and going to Cal Arts and being like, oh, no, like I can just do everything I like. I can even write and I write like so my short story collection has a play in it. You know, um, I still do dramatic writing, but just for the page. And I keep it that way. And I stay really specifically book and text and page focused because I think that's how I can just honor everything instead of just letting it get away from me um and so that that's why I, I guess I became like an author as I was like this is the space where I can really cook and really experiment and not be limited and it's not even about like collaborators messing that up because I mean I love working with editors I had such amazing time working with Jackson Howard at FSG on this book and some of my favorite parts of the book were born out of our later conversations and things I added but it was more like, I know that I will be limited um, on that first, in that first stage, you know, if I'm not just writing a book, if it isn't something that I am going to get to control all the way till I show it to my agent. That really became, that's how I know I'm an author, I guess now, or will be for a little while, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was such a thrill for me to see this book, which is so experimental, you know, published by FSG and um, it was really cool. Um, also, I know Jackson, Jackson has great taste and he publishes Brontes Purnell, who's another writer that I really love. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anything you've read recently that you love? I mean, I just read Brontes's forthcoming book, comes out on Valentine's, um, 10 Bridges I Burnt, which is, it is, it's a memoir in poems. It's, it's very much poetry. It's just these wonderfully titled poems um, that form like a really beautiful you know, portrait of Brontes's life and or aspects of Brontes's very myriad creative life, you know, wonderful. Uh, and so that, that was great. I, yeah, I just, I had a blast reading that um, early. I guess I'm, I get, I get lucky. I get to get a couple of early books. Um, that's one that really, really got me um, right at the beach. It was perfect. Um, but I also just feel like, yeah, a kinship with a lot of authors right now that are, that are working in the, in the flow of, you know, of genre, you know, whether it's, you know, coming from poetry or coming from um, hybrid work or, you know, nonfiction work into, into just tackling a novel or what we call a novel, you know, everybody else be damned <laughs> or a memoir or whatever. Um, I really, I love that people um, are not, are not feeling constricted um, because I can see the beauty of each voice across the genres they tackle I, like against that, that's how I really see voices I'm like oh they're they're trying something new but I I see them in it and that's just fantastic that's something that I will always be excited about um people shifting you know genre allegiances or whatever um yeah 
Wonderful. Well, those are, those are like my primary questions for you. Um, let me look in the chat. Um, oh, and your, are your parents here, Henry? That's like really cute. Yeah. I, mean, I saw my dad. I know he's here. Um, I don't know. Hi mom. If you're here, don't worry about it, but yeah, they, they've, 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 they're like my biggest, you know, they're my biggest supporters. That's um, so amazing. Yeah. And that's great because, well, you know, like, and that's what's funny is I'm like, well, yeah, the most fictional part of this book is that there's like a violent father. <laughs> where it's like, my father's a very gentle man. He's been very encouraging of everything and um, especially my writing. Um, yeah, You're so um, yeah, they, I know they've been on the ride. Um, I don't know. They were, yeah, it's been great. I did a, I just did an event in my hometown in Virginia and they were there and it was great. Um, but yeah, that's what's been fun about the Zoom is, you know, People I love from all over can tune in, um, including people yeah. from Paris. Uh, yeah, back in here. Um, thank you both Hi, so Paris. much for for this conversation. Um, obviously, you can't see our audience because they're all on Zoom, but I hope they're applauding as much as I am. Um, it was so wonderful to hear your shared perspectives on this. Um, we're opening this question up to the Q and A portion now. Uh, the Q and A chat box is it's looking quite empty so if you're in the audience uh, now's the time to get thinking um i'll take the time to ask a quick question as we wait um and if no one else posts any questions i have many more uh so i can keep us here all evening um but henry i wanted to to touch upon um what you were saying about um your relationship with political engagement um i have kind of a, a two-part question here, the first is whether you consider your own writing to be activist writing, and the second part of this to expand that more broadly is the extent to which you believe political engagement via fiction is possible at all. Great question, thank you, Emily. I think I don't know. I mean, I I'm not I'm not one for labels, you know. I, I and I think that it sets up expectations. Um, I feel like I can't separate my writing from my beliefs especially when I go really into something and I the books I wrote over the pandemic were open throat and then I wrote my memoir sticker which actually came out last year um with Bloomsbury but I was sort of on contract to write it right after I'd finished the draft of open throat um so after writing this very like fantastical imaginative but great vehicle for expression of my own let's say yeah certainly political and like gender-based feelings and thoughts um I got into this memoir of my hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia, um, which is, it's told in 20 stickers. So it's also very like playful and humorous and bizarre. Um, but each sticker sort of represents a different aspect of like the tapestry of this, you know, Southern town founded by Thomas Jefferson, you know, deeply fucked up, but also like sort of unfairly maligned as, as a people because of what happened with the white supremacist encroachment and the murder of Heather Heyer. Um, all this was like something I was grappling with in this book in a strange personal way. Um, and so that book couldn't help but almost bleed my activism or my feelings, you know, or my support for like anti-fascist action um, and social justice and, you know, wokeness, all these things that I think are vital. Um, There's critical race theory, things that are, you know, really at risk right now um, and, and certainly at risk in the state of Virginia. Um, so I feel like, right, my activism is inseparable from my writing. And I do believe that fiction engaged fiction is is wonderful. I think that it just, I mean, voice and editing and writing groups, friendship, all those things hinge on, you know, you could certainly read a book that is activist expressly. And it, I mean, there's manifestos, there is a place for activist literature. And I think it can absolutely be fictional. There has been many, there have been many for, forever, you know, engaged activist fictional expressions. But I think it's just, how can we not be in this moment? How can we, I, I want people to let their politics bleed into their writing. I think otherwise it feels disingenuous. I think we're bombarded with it. We have access to things, we can form opinions. So I, I want I want people to feel freed up to do it and not be afraid. Like I've read books, I definitely that seem to like, maybe that wasn't this, like they were doing enough, <laughs> if that makes sense. And then they sort of, you feel like, okay, they could have tweeted that or something or blogged that, but they just stick it in the middle of their book, you know? And I mean, no shade. Like. I love that that's happening. It's kind of exciting. But often I'm like, oh, well, I was already feeling these things from your fiction, you know? So it's really about that delicate dance right now because so many people are like, fuck, I want to express my rage, my frustration and my point of view and my, my you know, my 
political opinions. Yeah. Anyway. I love I love this idea of um kind of accidentally political writing, like the idea that no writing could be separated from the politics that created it because it comes from the community. Yeah. The community's political. Um, so it's not about yeah. It's not about the express, as you say, the effort put into it, but the fact that that is always latent to any act of uh, of creating art. Um, it's excellent. Uh, thank you. We we have some some questions in the chat as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have a question uh, from all. These are lovely. These these are from some very treasured members of the library community. Uh, Emma wants to know what the most joyful part of writing Open Throat was for you. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I mean, the whole book was very, I, I, I enjoyed writing it. It was very hard uh, emotionally to write, but but just as far as like enjoying writing, I don't think it ever wasn't enjoyable. You know, like I would go, oh, I'm feeling, I feel awful today because of what I'm going to have my cat go through and what I will then go through myself and have the reader go through. But it was just the fact that I was like, I was never, um, I was never not, uh, the joy was that it never stopped, the inspiration that because of the paradigm I set up in the voice, I just got excited to write. And I knew that I would find something to write about. It's like, well, there can be one little natural aspect. Like the, today the cat goes to the zoo. <laughs> like today the cat overhears this. I've just, I've never had that much um, fodder, as they say, or just like raw meat to work with. And so that made it joyful. I think at every step was that there was something to start with each day. And that's why I was able to draft it very quickly. Um, I, I got excited to write, which doesn't always happen. And sticker was not like that. I was very, I was like, oh no, I have to talk about some hideous political aspect of my childhood or whatever, you know, like it was a lot tougher, but this was a joy throughout, you know. But it's interesting because Stickers is a memoir. It's, you're very, it's explicitly that, but Open Throat is in some ways, we could say auto-fictional. It's, it's about you too, but was it somehow easier to express your experience through the vehicle of this lion? And, and why do you think that is? Yeah. A hundred percent. I think, and I think that's, what's great about fiction. I mean, I think that like, it's, yeah, it's way easier. Um, when I'm like, I'm me, what? Like, I don't know how people can do this sort of like really specific auto fiction, you know, like my stuff is very rarely that. Um, and when I do that, I don't super feel comfortable. So like my next book is also very much expressing a lot of stuff I want to express, but the voice could not be more different from mine in a way, um, or the choice fictionally, you know, it's, it's set like almost a century ago. So I'm sort of like in this really fun mode of like, that frees me up to be really mm. myself, mm. I think. Yeah. I wanna I wanna keep Melissa involved here too. Um I'm wondering if on this theme, Melissa, you could share something joyful about writing that you've experienced recently. Sure. So I think um the editing process is always well, not the like major surgery when I have to move big chunks around because um but I think that like the line editing process, when it becomes distilled to just the language and you're just finding like the perfect word, you know, when you're edit sort of uh, when I edit, like when I'm editing a novel on the line level, like poetry, that to me is the most joyful because I get to totally disappear into language. And um, that's, I think when I'm, even though, editing, you know, is the, is the most maybe stop and start, um, you know, it's not the same as the drafting process, which for me is usually much more of a, I'm not considering the reader in the drafting process. I'm not considering um, the, yeah, I'm not considering the reader. I'm not thinking about communication or clarity, or it's really just about getting the raw clay out there that I then can sculpt, right? Because unlike sculptors, we have to make our own raw material, right? So um, with a painter, you know, they have the canvas, they have the paint, you have to prime the canvas. But we are literally, we have to create, we have to construct, we have to build the canvas, we have to build the um, paint, so to speak, right? And then, um, you know, and that, that for me is not always, the, the drafting process is not always as joyful as, interestingly, even though one would think that it would be just like the flow and the, the getting that out there, but the, um, the editing, the line editing process, even though it is so stop and start, for some reason, I find that I can get really lost in it in such a beautiful way. I love that. I love thinking about, yeah, like you've gotten all the clay and now you get to play with it and sculpt it. That's just, or, or chisel it. Like, that's just, that's such a beautiful way to 
God, I want to I want to take that into my next editing process so, so I can find some joy. <laughs> totally. And like I said, you know, I think that there's a difference between that line editing versus like when I get a note from an editor, especially when it's an editor letter, um, and I'm asked to do major surgery and I'm like, can you point to where like the editor letter always baffles me because it's we so for those who are not writers or so basically like you get this this letter from your editor about the rounds of edits that you have to do and um <laughs> and um it's like sometimes you have to do major surgery and I'm like can you just like point more specifically to where on the body because it's very scary when it's like well this sort of something needs to change right but it's like not pointing to the organ and I'm like the portion show me the good. organ totally is it, can I ask if we're pursuing this analogy of painting and canvas, um, and I assume you're working with both the story itself, the plot and the language, which which is the paint and which is the canvas, which comes first? Um, well, I, I think clay is probably a better metaphor, actually. Yeah. I just decided to do two. Okay. Um, you know, we love for... a bit of, of mixing metaphors here. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think that like, you know, the clay, the words are the clay, right? And we don't, and we have to excavate them. And it was interesting, um, you know, and then we get to sculpt and then we get to sculpt some more. And then, or I say get to, but sometimes in the process of of writing a novel, it's sort of, I've, you know, I've heard, I don't have children, but um, I've heard people who have children say that like, if you remembered um, what, well, now there's like, I think better drugs, but like, let's say my mother, said you know you you don't remember the pain because otherwise like you wouldn't do it again and she did it twice you know and I think like a novel is such a long haul it's really you know it's an odyssey but it's um yeah but I would say yes the clay is the you know we're having to like really create our own raw materials um and but I loved what Henry said about you know being <laughs> the think being a, a, a for an eternal thinker right just like that or incessant thinker and um you know it's like what is the difference between a writer and a thinker you know a writer writes down and a writer edits but um you know I certainly relate to that just writing as um that way to um you know like being like a I see it a, another metaphor um, I see it as like, you know, being like a, a clam with a grain of sand in its shell. And there's that itch, the itch of life. And it's like, we have to excrete this substance or I, you know, excreting this substance to make the sand a little, to make it more comfortable. And sometimes you get a pearl and sometimes you're, you know, and, and sometimes you do not get a pearl. Oh, but wow. open throats a pearl. Oh, Melissa, you are you. on it with the metaphors tonight. I know. Um, just like boom, boom, boom. It's fantastic. The <laughs> age of life. Um, it's wonderful. Thank you. I wanna, I wanna turn back uh, to the Q and A now that we have mm -hmm. this, 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 this new um, library of metaphors to work with. Um, Jamie Stetton. Hello, Jamie. Uh, Jamie has said, I love how you developed the mountain lion's voice, uh, as do I. Uh, and I'm wondering how you decided on the rules of their lexicon slash vocabulary slash expression. How did you de decide on what they could or couldn't understand, such as LA and scarcity? And for those who haven't read the book, you can see in this message what we meant when we were talking about LA being scared differently or scarcity. Um, there's a lot of playing with language in this book, so yes. Yeah, I really, I, it was, it was an act of like restraint, I think, and also just kind of not giving a fuck. Um, the restraint was the linguistic play with L-A-E-L-L-A-Y, you know, L-A, because that just felt phonetic to me. And there's other phonetic things like you, you'll see, like there's no soft H or something. Like I play with that a little bit. You just hear, oh, you know, um, I forget, but you know, things like that where I was like, this will work and not be too distracting. But I didn't want to create like a whole other language because I I've read books like that, you know, where you're like, it's just not me. It's not my form. Um, others can do it. And I, you know, with mixed results but I think that for me it was like that's going to be just enough that it's going to give it more meaning like LA being a a broader like other place than actual LA and then scarcity was incredibly important to the to the ideas of the book so that was the one that I really enjoyed and leaned into um otherwise I just sort of my my first editor who's my partner um basically would 
would help me like look at where I had and hadn't had certain understandings or words. And we had this sort of idea that, you know, later in the book, you know, spoiler, but the cat is sort of, there's an attempted domestication situation by like a teenage witch in Los Angeles. Um, and I was like, well, a lot of the language will come from this character, from this teenage witch. And it's, you know, reviewers have talked about like that sort of like Gen Z language or whatever, you know, um, I'm like, yeah, like that, that informs it. There's a moment where the cat says, but I don't have that word yet you know, about the word reflection. And I was like, that's how I can sort of get away with this. It's really, I mean, all fiction is getting away with something. And then specifically was like, how can I just get away with really expressing what I want, but keeping it restrained and somewhat believable, although completely fantastical. And I think just, you know, y'all could tell me how it went, but that was really how it was for me. It was like, I liked it. I felt it was okay. It, it flowed that these words could could be expressions from a future time or an afterlife or some place where the cat could actually say something. But that is also a big theme of the book is like the lack of being able to express these things. So here's where we have it in this magical object, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting that you say that a lot of that came in the, in the editing process. Um, Melissa, we've heard about your relationship to editing. And Henry, you've mentioned that um, you wrote this very quickly, but I'm curious to hear about what came after, what your experience was editing it, and more broadly, what your perspective is on editing as as a feature of the writing process. Gosh, I mean, I think it's crucial, and it's so different for every work. I, I I've never had the same editing process. You know, I've, I've um, for me, yeah, I write very distilled, and there's not a lot to cut or a lot to. So it's really about like sharpening. Um, and and keeping consistent. There was a moment, you know, there was a moment in my first draft where like there's a totally different voice, and I was like, no, this, you know, my, my editor was like, you know, my partner was like, no, this, it has to be just just the mountain lion mm -hmm. the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, this was a very brief moment, but then working with Jackson at FSG, like like Jackson gave me permission to 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 bring in some more things, and they weren't different voices, but they were moments of like weaving time. A little bit into flashback and into reverie and there's sort of a vision of a post-human world um, that comes in later like quite late in the book uh, to break up the climax I thought it was amazing for pacing that was Jackson's idea so so things like that where I was just I was kind of on a roller coaster writing this and like you said quickly fluidly so to have the like an editor see where I could just stop and give myself a break and also give my mind a new generative moment mm -hmm. and create new content what a gift you know that was great and so that was really special and nice and that has happened in my other books as well um where i'm given the permission to create more and what that's amazing yeah i'm struck by something that that you seem to return back to over and over again as you as you answer these questions with such oh. eloquence and grace which is the idea of writing as this collaborative community act um that is that always speaks to and for um the community. I mean, did you have an idea of the community that you were speaking to and for in writing this book? Or do you think literature can be, there's a distance between writing about oneself and from oneself and writing for the group as well? Gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, I I, I, I curated a lot of live events in Los Angeles um, with writers um, and performers and artists. Um, I've always been performance- a performance enjoyer or a performance engager. I see an immense amount of theater. My my significant is an actor and and theater maker and filmmaker. So, you know, I love the social aspect of creation and, and all those things. Um, like I said, I liked being a producer. So and I like so I was basically a curator and director of a of sort of a literary happening um, in Los Angeles. And um, so I always do think about audience and not not audience like who because I wanted this book especially. I was like I want book clubs to read this and I want you know my punk ass friends to read it you know like I want that to be kind of a fun yeah. I want it to bring people together in that way with something kind of poppy and appealing and direct and imaginative um but again I just tried it and it it worked out so that was amazing but I just thought of audience being like um it is for someone like it could be for anyone but I'm not just ignorant of that someone's going to read this and they're going to devote their time to it not very much time <laughs> you know but that's part of the what I do but I just wanted to have that aspect um I think of of like, yeah, like you're you're devoting your time and your eyeballs and your mind to to my work, yeah. and I I thought that about reading. I always think about that performing my writing. Like I, I I've seen writing where reading where people really don't seem like they want to read and it doesn't like bring the audience in. But I like always think about that. And the more I was doing that in performance, the more it informed my actual, you know, hermit like novel writing. I was like, no, I'm like I'm reading to someone right now. If this isn't interesting to read out loud, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna finish this page. You know what I mean? That's a big part of my practice. Yeah. 
you strike me as a very empathy-based thinker and writer um, with the ability to inhabit both you know, Puma's minds and also the minds of, of your readers as well. Um, I think it's a very admirable characteristic to have as, as an engaged intellectual in the world for what it's worth. Um, we have time for one last question. Melissa, is there anything else left on your heart that you would like to ask this brilliant young author who's in our midst? Well, I'm not going to ask yeah. you what you're doing next because I, <laughs> that question's always, but okay. Can you just give us like a tiny bit about the goddess? Well, I know, I understand that you're saying you might be, what you're working on now might have goddess. Give us a little. Yeah. I'm having a similar thing that I often do is I'm sort of working on or dancing around a larger book or something that maybe I'll never finish or just a collection or something. And, and it's more maybe traditional. And then I'm just like, no, I'm just going to like devote a couple months to writing something completely bizarre. That's just coming out of me, um, you know, unstoppable. And that's, what's now happening. So I, I hope to write this book and get it out, you know, like to, to my, to my beloved agent and editor, um, in the next, you know, happy year or something. But so I'm really just getting into it. Um, I freed up some space in my life from all the of all the open throat ness of life. Um, but it, it is, yeah, it, it's it's another monologue, which is what's so exciting to me. Um, is I was like, no, I like I love this form. I love to just write in one voice because the minute I started thinking about in this other project that I am not writing right now and may never write, where I was like, oh, there has to be like a narrator that balances characters and has their own perspective. I was like. I love filtering the world through one voice. And so, yeah, this is a fun one. It is, yeah, I, I'm thinking about like, you know, this book I, Open Throat, I characterize as like the autobiography of a goddess of vengeance um, at some point. That was like how I gave myself the the core of it. Um, and I'm like, you know, I think I'm kind of doing that again. Um, and I'm taking inspiration from a, from a family member of mine. This is the first time I'm saying this publicly. So just for y'all, um, Paris. Um, she had a, she had a European European inclination. So let's throw that out there. Um, my cousin was an actress named Tallulah Bankhead, um, who was you know like an actress in London and, and New York in the 30s and 40s, and then had a very like strange Hollywood career and legend because she was so sort of debaucherous and unique. You know, her parents were uh, her her father was a was speaker of the House of Representatives, um, so she was very like strangely privileged and bizarre. But she's from Alabama and. She's an inspiration to me. I've read everything she's ever written and I I tweet as her, you know, like things like that. I was like, well, you know what? Let's let's like I'm not writing as her, but I'm taking inspiration from a figure, a um, it's sort of a Western about like a blacklisted um actress in the 1930s, like at the dawn of like American Nazism and stuff. So I'm sort of excited about that. Um, that's what I'm writing right now. Um, yeah. <laughs>